I'm with the Meter Consulting Group. I'm also an instructional coach at LCTI, Lehigh Career and Technical Institute, and I am on leave this year taking on this wonderful role. I hope everyone is ready for this great hour or hour and 15 minutes of collaboration. You are muted right now, um, so if you are having any technical diff difficulties, of course, if you can't hear me, that would be a problem, but if you're having any other technical difficulties, you can type those into the question box, and uh, we'll try to help you as much as we can. The second thing I'd like you to be aware of is um, we are taking attendance based on your registration and your, and your logon right now. However, if you have a colleague with you who did not register, would you please type that person's name into the box so they get credit for being here? And actually, just type a hello into the question box. Uh, you know, just tell us who you are, just so we know that uh, you're communicating with us and that, we, that you can clearly hear me. Okay, I'm going to keep moving, and uh, we will unmute you as needed. So if you have your hand up, remember that little hand icon we talked about during the um, introduction? And if not, you'll see it on your screen. Your screen might be different than mine, uh, but it's a little hand. And if you click on that hand, we will see that as you have raised your hand, and then we can unmute you so that you can let us know what it is you'd like to share. Or if you're uh, more comfortable just typing your comment or questions in, please do that at any time. We've entitled this session, Start Strong, Stay Strong. We're exploring the classroom environment and shows a little cartoon that I think we could all relate to to get us off to a good start. Uh, I know it's November, and so your start has already come and gone for the school year. So today we're going to talk about some routines and procedures, mostly academic routines and procedures, that might just re, uh, rejuvenate you or might give you a uh, spark you to try a new idea, or might simply just bring you back to, yeah, I really need to touch base with my classroom organization and engagement and see how it's going. You'll hear a few different voices today. Um, in the room with us, so to speak, our virtual room, we have Jennifer Grams. She's also from Meter Consulting Group. I, Jennifer, I think, is muted herself. We do that so that you don't pick up our background noise. But Jennifer, if you'd like to jump in and say hello, feel free. Otherwise, um, I'll keep going. Good morning, everyone. Thanks for joining us today. We're happy to have you here. Thanks, Jennifer. Jennifer will be monitoring your questions and your comments. So far, we have a couple of hellos. Um, thank you for doing that. Keep those coming. We, we know how many people are here. Did you know we even know if you're paying attention? This virtual world, this big brother world, is a little intimidating. Yes, we have a little button that lights up when you leave your screen, so we know if you've left us. So uh, just check in with us. I'm teasing you, of course. And we have a special guest today, and that is Tracy Stetler, who's coming to us from Reading Muhlenberg, and I'll introduce uh, Tracy Moore in just one moment. So let's take a moment now to just uh, check that you can hear me, that I can uh, see you in the comments. We have quite a few. Good morning to those of you, and hello um, to those of you who have, who have uh, typed your name in, and a morning greeting. Keep those coming. It doesn't look like we have any questions on technology at this point, Jennifer. All right, today's webinar has a few pieces to it. Uh, the first thing we need to do is a little work for our director, for the director of uh, the Bureau of Career and Technical Education in Pennsylvania, Dr. Lee Burkett. She has a question for you, and we'll get to that in just a moment. Then we'll get to the heart of our discussion today, which Tracy will be uh, facilitating, and that's uh, the piece on environment and routines and procedures. We have just a few minutes of follow-up at the end, and then although we have question and answers reserved for the end, we certainly would prefer that if, as you have a question or a comment, you just type that in, and we will um, gently interrupt Tracy as she's speaking and let her know that there's a question. So please, this webinar, this collaboration, as we said at Penn State, it's only as good as you make it, 
So please share your ideas, share your comments, share your questions. That's what this is all about. So agenda item number one, Dr. Burkett is starting to plan the June PAC Tech Conference. And even if you cannot be at the conference, she wants to know from, from your uh, group specifically, um, what, would you, what would welders, welding instructors, like to see at the session specifically? Is there a piece of equipment that you're interested in seeing the manufacturer come and speak on? Is there a textbook publisher? Is there something specific from Nocti? Um, this is your opportunity to have a direct ear to Dr. Burkett. We are compiling this information and we'll be giving this to her. You are our last webinar for, for November for this session. So we will be giving her this information uh, probably later today. So you've got a direct ear. What conference session would you like to attend if you were to attend the conference? Type that in and Jennifer will capture your feedback. And while you're thinking of that, I will introduce our guest speaker, Tracy. Uh, Tracy Stetler started her career in education as a culinary arts instructional assistant. And she did that at uh, Berks, County, uh, Berks uh, Career and Technology Center for about five years. And then for 12 years, she was a baking and pastry arts instructor at Reading Muhlenberg. And she's also a high school graduate of that program. In 2011, Tracy transitioned into the literacy integration specialist position at uh, Reading Muhlenberg, which is where she is now. And as a literacy coach, she spends the majority of her time helping program instructors like you incorporate reading, writing, listening, and speaking, and thinking skills into theory lessons and performance criteria. She models strategies. She uses technology to enhance program content and to develop new ideas for embedding literacy into all programs. She's currently working on a, a program that's analyzing NOCTI data in order to assist with the development of a program-specific NOCTI plan of action. And she's also very interested in helping teachers uh, critically look at and improve classroom management. So she facilitates learning walks and gets into classrooms. I'd like to thank Tracy so much for joining us today. At this time, we're, Tracy and I are going to switch screens. So give me a moment just to hand over the, the screen to Tracy. And I just do this very slowly so I don't cut anyone off. OK, Tracy, let me know when we have your screen. I think it's, I think we got it. So Jennifer, will you just confirm for me that you can see Tracy's screen? I sure can. Thanks, Kathy. Um, before we turn over to, okay. I'm sorry, um, it looks like Mark might have his hand, or it looks like he has his hand raised, so he might have a question. Do you mind if we just check in with him before sure. Tracy starts? Mark, I'm going to unmute your microphone. Did you have something you wanted to ask or share? Looks like your hand uh, is raised. No, I've got it figured out. I couldn't find the box to write questions in, but I, I've got that figured out now. Okay, perfect. Thank you. All right, all clear. Okay, and Tracy, if you don't mind, we'll just probably touch base with you at the end of every slide to let you know if there's any questions or comments. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, Tracy. Thanks. Go ahead. Okay. All right. Um, again, I'm Tracy Settler. I'm the Literacy Integration Specialist at Reading Muhlenberg Career and Technology Center. And uh, at the end of this PowerPoint, and I know um, Kathy will be sending you a copy of the PowerPoint when we are finished, my contact information is on there. So if there's anything that, that you need from the PowerPoint, you will have it. If there's anything additional that you would like that I've discussed um, that you'd like some further information on, you can email me. My email address is on one of the last slides. So uh, that would be great if I could hear from you and uh, get, get your feedback. Or if you, you need any help with anything, I'd be more than happy to um, assist you. 
So the three areas that we're going to talk about today in the webinar are routines and procedures, um, engaging learning environment, and positive relationships. And these were three areas that were identified uh, when you were at Penn State meeting as a group for the first time to kind of kick off your, your PLC and uh, you know, identified as areas you would like some more information about. So that's why these areas were chosen. And I'll uh, address these three areas with uh, a little bit of um, talk, and then I'll give you some examples. So the first one is routines and procedures. Um, preparation and organization, of course, is key in this area. Setting clear expectations for uh, what the students will do every day, in addition to it, thinking about what you will do every day um, and what you will do on that particular day, having yourself organized and ready to go. Uh, in our school, we are required to do a reading, writing, and math, reading some sort of literacy activity and math every day for every level of instruction. So in the morning, we uh, have level one and level two, and in the afternoon, we have level one and level three. So essentially, for every one of those levels, we are doing a theory lesson every day that will involve some sort of reading, writing, literacy activity, and a math activity every day. Now that can be uh, part of a formal theory lesson in the class, or it can be transferred as a hands-on activity that would you know, be an enriching part of, of that uh, hands-on learning experience. Um, what do you expect? Um, you know, and what will your students expect from you? And you know, here's where um, I think we use a classmate grading system, but contract grading is a big part of this. Um, you're setting a clear uh, expectation of that student, um, what they will accomplish during that quarter or that period of time that you set for them. And uh, they know exactly what they need to be working on. There's no guesswork. Um, you know, they're using learning guides to help along with this process. They're utilizing their textbook. You know, they are being shown by example what needs to be done for that period of time. And uh, you know, classroom contract rating is an important part of this. If you don't already do it, you could do it in a more informal way, um, you know, maybe not using a classmate grading system, but just setting out. Um, you know, before we used the classmate grading system, we did um, you know, some things with the students where we sat and we talked to them about what was expected of them for the rest of that quarter and what, what they would like you know, to accomplish themselves. You know, they need to set goals as well. Another thing that's um, kind of important with your scenes and procedures is gaining those students' attention from the get-go. So right away, um, when they come in the door, that um, you know, they're seeing something that will gain their attention. Now, this could be a video that you have queued up, um, a word of the day, a math problem of the day, some sort of writing prompt that get them thinking right off the bat what they're going to be kind of um, expected to do for that day, a picture that relates to something maybe you're going to cover and it kind of sparks their interest, uh, or a quote. Um, you could have a quote of the day and I'll show you some examples of that. Also getting your students into some habits, um, some daily routines. This builds independence, it builds responsibility. The students know what, the, what is expected of them. They have a responsibility to be prepared for class, uh, whether it be having their pencil, their journal ready when they walk in the door, or changing into a uniform, having um, you know, their safety glasses, their work boots on, they're ready to go, uh, they have their tool tags, whatever it is that they need to get started and working right away when you uh, are finished with whatever lesson you're going to do for the day that they are ready to go and there's no downtime. The downtime is what, you know, of course, really creates the issues in a lot of classrooms. You know, if students don't have enough to do or they don't know what to do at any given moment, when you set these daily routines, they, you know, there's no question. They know what they have to do. If they need a reminder, then it needs to be given. Other students can remind each other as well. But, uh, you know, as far as it gives them that responsibility that they need and want. This is one example of a daily reflection sheet that comes from actually one of our health classrooms, but a lot of the teachers in our building use a format similar to this. They're not all the same, uh, but uh, this is one example. And uh, across 
their student would um, write their name. And uh, every day of the week, they would be required to write what they accomplished that day, what they did that day. Um, and I know in, when I was in the classroom, uh, you know, you have 40 students in the AM and 40 in the PM, and you can't remember what every single student was doing every single day for a week's time, um, even a day's worth of time. And to have them write that down for you is important because then you, they can do their own task tracking. You can follow what they're doing you know, as far as getting their tasks completed for their task list and their job titles. And you know, if they don't write it on their sheet, well, you know, I guess then they maybe won't get credit for it because they've got to understand that this is part of their responsibility. Um, across the top, you'll see trace, explain, analyze, summarize, free write. These are um, part of the trace, explain, analyze, summarize are, are part of 12 powerful words, which uh, students will see on every standardized test that's given. And we have posters in our rooms, and we've kind of given an introduction to our teachers about the 12 powerful words and how to use them, how to get the students to uh, understand what these words mean to help them with these standardized tests. They're seen on NACTI, they're seen on you know, SATs. So uh, you know, this particular instructor uses them to get the students to write about what they did that day. So in Monday, it's trace. So list the steps what you learned today. Tuesday is explain, tell how, who, what, when, why. Um, and then there's a spot in the bottom, in the middle there, for vocabulary. So if there's a vocabulary word of the day or words that were covered during a theory lesson or a, a, you know, a clinic, they can write them in there and define them. And also a spot for a math problem of the day. Most of our program areas do a math problem of the day. And some are in addition to a math that they would cover during their regular theory lesson or something that's covered out in the shop area. But either way, there's a spot for the math problem. Some teachers also go above and beyond, and they already have their vocabulary in for the day. They already have the math problem embedded right into that sheet so that you know the students already have it. They don't have to wait for it if you're not ready. It's already there. Now, that would require a lot of extra you know, planning on your part, but um, some instructors here um, you know, like to do that. They like to have everything pre-planned ahead of time, you know, weeks ahead of time. So I know, you know, I do a word of the day, which I'll show you in a minute, and uh, they want those slides. They want me to send those words to them so they know what those words are going to be way ahead of time. This is another example of uh, a journal entry sheet. This is from um, Auto Body Repair, and the student writes their name and the date. This is a daily sheet, so this would be filled out one of these every single day, so as opposed to the last one we saw, which was a weekly sheet. Um, there's auto body word of the day, and this could be a few words. I know he does safety words, he does hand tool words. So, you know, there could be multiple words of the day that are covered, um, defining those. And there's an SAT word of the day, which I provide um, as part of my word of the day. At the bottom, he already has a math problem that's embedded for that day, uh, which is related to his field. This is not a, uh, just a random math problem that maybe they'll see on the SATs or something like that. This is a a math problem that is directly related to the program area. And you know, that's important. I, you know, I know what it's like to be a program instructor. I'm not a math teacher. I'm not, you know, you know teachers aren't reading specialists. And uh, you know, this stuff is more program related and needs to be program related. The students need to understand the math and the literacy that's involved in their program area. And that's what the focus should be. You know, I've never gotten away from that, even becoming a literacy coach. I'm not going to get away from that, because that's what my instructors need, and that's who I work with. So in the middle there, there's a plain box, and that uh, is where the students would write what they did for that day. So it could be part of their theory lesson. They took a test. Maybe they you know, had some sort of um, project they were working on as a team. They could write those students' names down with that. So it's a, a spot for them to write down what they accomplished that day. This is an example of a program area booklet that we uh, started using in our school last year. And uh, not every program area uses it. This is a, a, by choice. If uh, a, a program area decides they would like to use this format, they adopt it with my help. And uh, this is one from Welding. And he has adopted this in his program area, um, our welding instructor. And uh, this booklet is uh, a week's worth of material in here, which is worth 100 points towards your weekly grade. So it's not the entire weekly grade. There could be tests and you know other things for the week. But this 
would encompass, um, you know, every day, 20 points per day, um, a literacy and a numeracy activity that is um, straight from their program area that is related to the um, theory lesson that was done for that day. So this would be the front of that booklet where there's a spot for the name and the grade, and then there's a, a quote at the bottom as well. And then on the next page, this is day four assignment I just happened to choose. This is worth uh, five points. The word of the day is worth five points. So they would define uh, that word, using it in a sentence. Uh, there's a math problem of the day. In his case, he does his math problem on the smart board. So that is already up and ready for the students. It's not embedded into this packet. Some are. It depends on the instructor whether they want the math problem to be typed right in there or not, and they do that if they want that. Otherwise, it's shown on the screen, and the students copy it down and, and complete their work in that fashion. On the other side, there is a paragraph of the day and a minimum of five sentences, and uh, this is the writing prompt. And all this is directly related to that, um, you know, again, that theory lesson that was held that day or whatever is going on out in the shop, you know, you're, we're going to be shown, you know, this or whatever. So it's all tied together in a nice package for the day. And this would go on for the entire week. And this portion of the packet is worth 20 points. And there's also a rubric so the students understand um, the, uh, you know, um, the writing what they should be, you know, doing with the writing, like, you know, indenting the paragraph, the minimum of five, and things like that, whether their word choices are good, uh, and, and whether they're actually answering the prompt question. This is an example of the word of the day that I put up on the screen. Um, you know, so this is done on our TV screens. We have TVs in all our rooms, and there's a um, rolling all kinds of messages are scrolled on this screen every day. You know, it could be announcements about things, cancellations, things that are going on that day, guests that are in the building. Uh, but part of that is the word of the day. So that's up every day. And these are the words that a lot of the instructors want ahead of time to put in their packets if they want to do that. Uh, this is an example of math mania that our math coach, who is wonderful, um, she puts one of these up every week. And this can be done as a program area. The entire program area does them individually. Or uh, students can do them individually on their own. And uh, you know they're in for a drawing for prizes, which is really nice. So if they answer the question correctly, they have the, um, you know, the answers correct in the box, and they put it in there, they can win a prize. And it's usually related to some kind of theme. So this was a few weeks ago for Halloween. So it was pumpkin mania. And she always ties it to something that's going on in the school, which makes it a lot more personal for the students. And this is a good example of something that could be um, taught in your area by another student. You could have another student um, teach this math concept to the other students in the classroom. So it gets the heat off you. You don't have to be doing a math lesson that maybe isn't real directly related to your program area. And this is by choice again. But uh, you know, the students could accomplish this as they'd like to, and you could use a student to teach the lesson, um, you know, someone who's really good at this kind of concept. And uh, you know, a lot of the Noctis have this kind of uh, question on it about sales tax and about you know, calculating you know, estimates and things like that. So it's not completely out of line for program areas. And she does try to choose different program areas to highlight when it comes to her math mania. Tracy, I'm going to jump in for a minute. Oh, OK, go okay. ahead with this slide, and then I'll jump in, because I think I might piggyback okay. off of this one. All right, so this is an example of the quote of the day. And uh, this is from actually the public safety and security program. But uh, our welding instructor here at the school uses the quote of the day. He has that up every day. His students expect it. And uh, you know, if it's not there, they're questioning why it's not there. But oh, where's the quote? You know, and, and if it's not there, or if he so chooses, he'll have a student look up the quote of the day and put it up on, up on the um, board for him. So the students are choosing the quotes you know, uh, some of the time. And uh, you know, they like it. And they'll talk about the quote itself. They could talk about the person. So there's a lot that can be learned about a quote. And it can be directly related to someone's program area or just, just those, um, you know, those key uh, um, you know, job skill uh, issues that the students kind of are not related to it right now, but could be you know, enlightened about while reading a quote by someone. 
So, um, you know, that's the quote of the day. Okay, I'm going to jump in then, if you don't mind, Tracy. This is Kathy, everyone. Um, I, I would like you to type in um, to our participants if there is an academic, you know, a routine that's, that's related to academics, like starting with a quote of the day or a word of the day. Type in your, uh, if you can briefly explain it, type in something that you do that wasn't discussed here so that we can share that with the group. And while you take them, while you're thinking of that, I just want to share one of our, I believe it was an electrical teacher said, he does a quote of the day and just a little bit different twist on it, which I, I, I thought was interesting. Um, he chooses quotes that purposely have what we call academic words in them. So, uh, similar to Tracy showed that her word of the day was allocate. And those are what we call academic words. As CTE teachers, I know you all do a great job of teaching your technical vocabulary, but what we know from research is that a lot of students are unable to answer test questions correctly, not because they don't know the correct answer, but because they can't understand the question when you put words like allocate in the question. And standardized tests always use that type of academic language. So this teacher takes a quote of the day that includes some level of academic word. And after they discuss the quote, he has the kids decide what would the power word in that quote be. They underline one power word, and that becomes their word of the day that he tries to use throughout the day. He incorporates into his own language and that the kids are encouraged to use in any quick writing prompt or even in their speech. I'm not sure if they get any kind of recognition if they're caught using the word, but I thought that was interesting. Another teacher uh, recently told us that he puts on the board every day or every few days um, one to three technical slang words. So the incorrect term for a welding process or a welding piece of equipment and then the kids um, have to define, have to, they talk about what is the technical word, what is the correct word for that, so that um, they are aware of what the slang is because that might be used in the shop, but what is the correct term, so when I'm reading technical journals or taking a, a, a certification exam, I would know the technical piece, the, te the true piece as well. So I thought those were two good ideas. Um, Jennifer, do we have anything else that we can read that anyone shared? Sure. Um, Mark, are, Jennifer, I'm sorry. That's okay. Um, Mark shared a couple ideas that he does a writing prompt every day and math league three days a week. Um, Ray typed in that he does a welding word of the day along with a school-wide word of the day. Thank you. Okay, keep your ideas coming. Um, Tracy, we'll go back to you unless I don't see any hands up to you, Jennifer. I think we're good to go. Okay, go ahead, Tracy. Okay. Um, something else that could be done uh, could be a tool of the week. I know we have a few new instructors in the building, and I know this helps them. Um, quite a bit because they feel as though some of the students maybe who should know some of these tools don't know them. So it's nice as a review for, you know, seniors taking a NACI that they, they need to be familiar with these tools. It's also nice for the level one students who are coming into your program. So um, this is an example of a tool of the week. What is this tool? Okay, so this is a pneumatic chisel. I'm not sure if it's used in welding, is it? Yeah, it's used in welding. Okay, good. So I did a good job by picking something that's used in welding. Um, but so you can have the students answer these questions either, uh, you know, throughout the week as it's being used, you know, so it could be something that's shown to them. Uh, what, what do they anticipate it might be? What is it? What's it for? So I didn't know what it was, so I could, you know, make a, some sort of guess about what I think it is and do that with the students. And then the next day they could maybe, you know, you could have an example of the actual tool there for them to hold and look at um, and talk about safety precautions involved with it. And then maybe have them going out into the shop area and actually using the tool. So it can, you know, turn into a, a nice theory lesson for, you know, a short, very short, to the point theory lesson for that week. Um, and then also what makes it unique, what are, what's it used for, you know, what are some, uh, you know, precautions that, with it. So you're covering that whole, the whole aspect of that tool. 
these are some examples of some photos you could have up for the students to be looking at when they come in. No, you know, maybe nothing else on the screen, but just this picture, uh, you know, of something that's related to your shop area that you're going to cover that day in the theory lesson, and get some talking. And uh, I know I used to do this in my program area when I was in the classroom, and a lot of the students would come in and be like, what is that? What is that? And I'll, we'll talk about it. You know, maybe sit down, write what you think it is. And you know, we'd, we'd get these guesses, you know, what they thought this particular picture was. And it could be something safety related, like the bottom left photo I just thought was too funny because, I mean, it's literally a piece of paper over his face, you know, and he's welding or something, and that's just ridiculous. And, and having the students see that and realize that that's ridiculous is, you know, a step forward. Um, you know, on the top left, there's some examples of different types of welds. And uh, top right, we have, you know, some blueprint reading things that they'd have to do, welding symbols. Uh, you know, and then on the right side there, there's a, an example of a weld. So, you know, these are, any pictures like this could be used to really you know, uh, get the student into that mindset that this is what we're going to cover that day, and wow, what is this, you know, and get their curiosity up. And Tracy, a lot I'm of the teachers in the, uh, sorry? I'm sorry, I just, can you go back to that last slide, or is that, I don't want to mess you sure. up. Uh, I just want to uh, uh, throw this out there. I know um, maybe it's basic for some, but you know how we're all on this big continuum with where we are with technology. I just want to mention um, that I, as I used to be an ESL teacher, and I would use photographs constantly, images and photographs to, uh, to identify things. And if you don't know how easy it is to get images on the internet through Google Images, make sure you ask someone at your school. You just do a Google search, but instead of searching for web, sites, you click on images and you know you can find so many great um, photographs that you then just right click on the picture and usually you can just copy it and paste it right into your document. So I just want to throw that out there in case that's uh, new to anyone. Sorry Tracy, thanks. Well we're paused. Um, this is Jennifer. I just wanted to share a comment that Jim typed in. He says, I have a picture of the front of the welding machine First, you have to identify all of the switches and knobs, and then tell the class how to identify the proper setup for the process given. So that's a way that he incorporates images into his classroom. Thanks, Jim, for sharing that. Thank you. Go ahead, Tracy. Yeah, that's wonderful. I, I like that idea a lot. Um, and something else that could be, you know, used with this, like the bottom right photo. There, there's a lot of different things that can be talked about with this, just this one image, you know, the weld itself, is it a good weld, is it a bad weld, what do you think about the weld, what kind of weld is it, you know, what do you think those two pieces are that are being joined together there, so there's a lot of discussion that could be involved with just this one picture, so, you know, it really gets the students talking and, you know, um, conversing about it, and getting them excited about what they're going to be doing. So this is Nazi Monday. We do this at our school because Mondays are co-op or work-based learning check-in day. And that's when most of the seniors are in the building. So our instructors utilize that day to the best of their advantage by doing a Nazi Monday. So it can be review on hands-on you know, performance part of the um, test or both, the written and the performance part or the written only, whatever. But um, you know, here's some examples of some questions from the Nazi. Um, for welding, and uh, and then as a kind of way to segue into your classroom area, into your into your um, lab area, you can have them listing tools and supplies they would need to complete a NACTI task in in the in that area. So for welding, you know, it could be what? so tools, you know, things like that for you know. Tips for electrodes, Danny says. So, you know, that could be something they could start working on, you know, things like that. So uh, it could be a hands-on activity that you have them practicing. So we do that on a Monday, again, because we have our seniors mostly that day. So that's a routine the students get, you know, accustomed to because it happens every single Monday. And if they're absent, they've missed that kind of, you know, and they've got to make it up somehow. Do you want me to keep going now? Well, or should I, I just 
I just want to add something, um, talking about um, NOCTI Monday. I, I'm sure a lot of people do something to review for NOCTI, and this is where a group like this, connecting, if you're the only welding instructor in your area, this is where you can really collaborate. Don't forget, we have a SAS, a community on SAS, that website from the state, and we can review that at the end if we need to. But if any of you want to share you know, your NOCTI review questions or your NOCTI review ideas, we can post those on your welding community, your PLC welding community, and you could start developing a bank of, of NOCTI review questions and ideas. Just, and that goes for anything we're talking about, but just keep that in mind. Thanks, Tracy. Okay, so engaging learning environment. So one of the things that we can talk about here is materials, and this kind of goes along with the very first slide I showed in the PowerPoint, which uh, you know talked about having things ready and being prepared for the day and what you're going to do that day. So planning what you're going to cover, what materials are you going to need for that particular lesson? Are you going to need some examples? Are you going to need your sheets ready? Are you going to, are the kids going to need their journals? You know, what is going to be needed that these students need to have ready or that you need to have ready for that particular lesson? So is the equipment set up and ready to go? Do you have that piece of equipment sitting in your theory room maybe for the students to look at and handle and talk about while you're discussing it? Um, lab setup. This is, kind of, this is an area where a lot of new instructors, they walk into a lab area and it's set up maybe the way they're not used to, um, you know, or it's just, you know, very, again, unfamiliar to them. Uh, maybe they don't understand why the lab was set up the way it was. But uh, one thing that can help you with lab setup and just making sure that your lab is set up in a way that's conducive to learning for students is getting your occupational advisory committee involved by having them come in and walk through and maybe even, you know, work in your lab for a day and have them give you some feedback about the setup, maybe some changes you could make to, to get things, you know, rolling a little bit smoother in your, in your lab area. So um, having them do walkthroughs, having them see students working in your area can, give a, can be, do a lot for a lot of feedback that you might need for your lab setup. Um, doing a learning style assessment with students. Uh, we do this uh, at our school on the computer, and um, we used to do a pen and paper one, and it was very cumbersome to um, assess, and you know, it took a long time. The computerized one is really easy, and I have the link to that on this PowerPoint that you can use. It's through Penn State, and uh, we've used it for a few years now, and the students really like it, and they like to understand, not only you should understand how different students learn, but the students enjoy knowing how they learn as well, and why they like to learn things the way they do. And you know, they answer a set of questions, and how, you know, depending on how they answer the question, they determine their learning style. So this is something I, I would highly recommend for you to do for every student in your class, and I'll talk about that in a second. I have an example of that. Um, grouping students, seating arrangements, color coding. Grouping students in a way that uh, you, know, you don't have just one student that's going to do all the work for all the other students in, in that group. Assigning students roles within that group, having a student be a timekeeper, having a student be, you know, the recorder, those kind of things. It creates that group atmosphere where everyone's a team, and um, you know, this can go a long way towards doing some good in your classroom, where you develop some classroom leadership skills with the students and uh, having them working together uh, as a team, which is all so important, uh, in, you know, in our program areas. Um, seating arrangements. You know, how's your seating arrangement look? Are they all looking at the back of each other's heads, or are they in pods, or and you can change this up? So, you know, not only the seating arrangement of students themselves, where they're seated, but how the seating arrangement is ar arranged in your room. You know, they could be in pods, they could be in rows, if that's what you like. It could be a big circle, and you can keep changing this. I know I've gone into classrooms, you know, three, four, five times per quarter, they're moving seats around. And you know, it's it's a way uh, for students to get out of their comfort zone. They get in that zone where this is where I sit forever. And uh, you know, switching them around a little bit doesn't hurt. 
And sometimes students like it. They'll go, when are you going to change the seats again? You know, they're asking when this stuff is going to happen because they want to know. So, you know, students like those kinds of things. And color coding. This is something that a lot of our, our teachers in our school have really adopted. Uh, we did a, uh, I did a, a little um, presentation with another teacher that uses color coding a lot. And we kind of introduced it to some of the teachers in the building. And they really ran with it and did their own kind of color coding. So not only just the color of paper, but that's a great visual for students to see. You know, they know purple sheets are the ones that are going to be due this quarter. They know the yellow ones are the ones that are coming up, or this is due this time and that time. And it, there's a code there that the students understand what the colors mean. And, you know, they get an idea. Of, and it's very good visual. They understand real quickly where they have to go, what papers they have to pull out. Um, in, the, in the baking program here, she also uses, she uses color coding in her pod. She has students in little pod areas. And every pod has their own color. So everything in that pod is blue, or everything in this pod is pink. And the bin is pink. The books have covers on them that she did with paper bags. And they have duct tape in blue on them. And all their pencils are blue. Their notebooks in that bin are blue. Everything in that bin is blue. Their paper is blue. So that way, she knows by sight, who is turning in what papers, what groups are done, what groups are you know still working. So it's a good visual for you, and it's good for students, because they know right off the bat, oh, I'm the blue group. I've got to get this. You know, This is my group, and I've got to pick up my bin and take it to my table. And again, those responsibility kind of things for the students and working together as a team. The next thing uh, is uh, bulletin boards, word walls, wordles, other visuals that you can have in your classroom. Um, bulletin boards are kind of a neglected area sometimes. Um, you, you, know, you come in, in in August maybe and put together a bulletin board with all the information the students need, like what times the for so much more. And get student feedback about this. You don't have to be the one doing all this work with the bulletin board. You know, utilize even utilize other classrooms. I've had students from early childhood education who have to have, have to do bulletin boards as part of their curriculum, you know, in, in a classroom, come up and do bulletin boards for other instructors. You know, they give them an idea about what they would like to see, and the students create a bulletin board for them. You can have students in your class do this. And this can in incorporate word walls where, you know, words are put up that you're going to cover in that, you know, uh, during that quarter or pictures of, of different things with the words with them, or having a game on the bulletin board where the students put the picture to the, to the word or, or whatever. So you know, these are good visuals in your class that make the, the learning environment engaging. It, make it makes it exciting for the students. And um, another way you can do this is with wordles. And I'll talk about that in a second if you don't know what that is. Other visuals, I know in another PLC that we did, one of the um, participants said that she hangs her words or pictures from the ceiling, from string, kind of like you know, like a preschool did. It's not preschool, but it's you know, it it uh, gets the kids looking and looking at that word because they see something going on that they hadn't seen before in your class. So changing things up, you know, is really big. Um, student mentors. I've used student mentors in a in a, a variety of ways. So not only can you have a student mentor another student that struggling with something, but you can have a student that you know you, um, you know, would like to challenge a bit, maybe have them raise the bar. So have them be a mentor to a new student. Um, this could be anything. This could be something in your classroom. This could be something as, as easy or as simple as having them help another student open a locker, or have them help another student carry a tray if they have crutches, or you know, having another student help with a math problem that another student is struggling with. So there's a lot of ways you can use student mentors. In our school, we have a large Hispanic population. I've used students to translate concepts that maybe were difficult to you know, understand for those students in English. And they were able to translate for me, which is really great. And it's a great um, tool for them, especially on a, on a resume, that they're bilingual and they can do these kinds of things with other students. So. You know, that's all, you know, again, giving them that responsibility and really making them feel like they're part of the, the team. 
So again, talking about student responsibility, getting their input on things. Um, so for example, and I'll show you a, a picture of this, we had a classroom that actually the students developed the classroom rules. Um, you know, they were tired of students not changing into their uniform and, and the teacher having to address this every single day. You know, they got tired of hearing it. The ones who were doing what they were supposed to be doing get tired of it. And, you know, they wanted to develop a set of classroom rules where there was no gray area. If you weren't in your uniform, you lose this many points. If you, um, you know, use, uh, you know, foul language, you Hmm. Okay, Tracy, I can no longer hear you. Um, Jennifer, are you able to hear Tracy? No, unfortunately I can't. Okay. Oh, she she okay. said, do you see that? Cut off. She's going to call okay. back in. Um, well, you know, let me, let me share here while Tracy's calling back in. Um, a couple ideas when she was just talking about student engage, or uh, keep uh, engaging classroom. One of the things I always loved at, um, at LCTI was our small engines teacher, Bill Young, wonderful, wonderful instructor. And he has a mirror right inside of his door. And it's a, a rather large mirror. And it says across the top that he, he just hand wrote this on the mirror, um, would you hire this person? And I think that that really sets the tone for the kind of um, environment that he is creating. He's creating, uh, you know, people who are going to go out into the workforce, hopefully, and um, he wants them to be prepared, both, you know, looking the part and acting the part. So I think that's just a great daily visual reminder. And then another thing, um, I wanted to share about keeping your, your, your classroom engaging. You know, in a CTE class, I started my career as an elementary school teacher. And much like an elementary school teacher, um, CTE teachers have kids for a long period of day, not that 42-minute period. And so one of the things that I did to try to build independence within my students so that I could work with small groups and not be interrupted, so that I could work with a student who was absent and not be interrupted, I had a poster in, I taught middle school and in high school, and in every classroom I've taught in, I had a poster that said, ask three before me. And I didn't just put that poster up and ignore it. I spent a couple, the first few weeks of school, explaining and re-explaining and reminding that their responsibility is that we're a group. We're learning from each other. I am not the only person in the room that can help them. So you must, if, if I am busy, you must ask three other people your question before you interrupt me. And if it's not that urgent, please don't interrupt me while I'm working with another group. And so I also had on the board at all times an appointment list. It was just simply, it said, make an appointment, and then there were numbers. Um, and if you needed to talk to me, the teacher, and I was busy, you would simply go over and put your name and to make an appointment. And then my responsibility as the teacher to make sure that kids believed me that I would that I would follow through. Every time I was done with a small group or working with someone, I would look, glance at that board. And, and if there was a name there, I went immediately to that person, not to anyone who was standing next to me who needed help, but to the person who made the appointment. Uh, and one other uh, thing to share, just I know Tracy's back on the line with us, but word walls, um, wonderful tool. If you don't feel you have room for it, be creative. We've seen people do such, like Tracy said, hanging the words down from the ceiling. Another person um, in our commercial arts had a floor to, has a floor-to-ceiling window and realized that he had no place for a word wall, but he could use dry erase markers and write on that window, and that became the word wall. So um, keeping that environment engaging is so important to keeping our kids um, interested in staying there and learning from us. Okay, welcome back, Tracy. Sorry, I don't know what happened. <laughs> well, I'm just glad I'm not the only call. one. I did this too on another group, so <laughs> I feel better now. Okay, thank you. All right, so we'll um, go on to the next slide. Um, if I can get there again. Okay, here we go. Okay, so this is an example of um, the question on the um, VAK assessment. So this is 
designed to figure out or assess whether a student is a visual, auditory, or kinesthetic learner. Now, a lot of students are going to say, well, what does that mean? So, you know, this is a good chance for you to kind of discuss with them what those words mean. And uh, uh, this is an example of one of the questions. If I'm teaching someone something new, I tend to. So write directions down, give them verbal, or demonstrate. And how they answer this question, of course, determines, and it's not just this question. It's about 30-some questions. And how they answer those questions determines what their learning style is. And some of them are multiple learning styles. And uh, you know, you take the assessment as well. The instructors here do it too. And you know, they kind of, it, it creates some good sharing amongst students and um, the teacher. And, you know, give everyone a good idea of how students are, you know, learn best. This is an example of a Wordle. If you're not familiar with Wordle, you can Google it and go right to the Wordle site and you can create. There's also some that are already made up in there, actually a lot. Um, but basically what you do is you type a word, uh, type words in, and you can do this or students can do this. This could be part of your bulletin board. Um, where um, you know you type the word in, and the more you type the same word in, the bigger that word will be. So I typed welding in, I think, three or four times. And PPE, I think I did twice. So that's a little bit, a uh, little bit smaller. And then the the other words, the the, the G uh, the G -taw and the and the MSDS were, um, you know, typed in once. So um, they will get bigger or smaller depending on how many times you you know, type those words in. And it makes for good, um, you know, it's a good way for students to learn vocabulary, you know, get that spelling correct. Um, they can, there's all different, I mean, you keep randomize, you hit the randomize button and over and over and over again, you'll just keep getting different fonts, different colors, different backgrounds. So, you know, they can keep hitting that randomize until they get something that they really like uh, or that really fits with, you know, their style. Did we lose you, Tracy? OK, I, Jennifer, I'm not hearing Tracy. Are you? No, unfortunately, I think we lost her again. Ugh. Okay, I can talk about positive relations until we get Tracy back. Tracy, are you there? Okay. Um, well, while we're waiting for Tracy, instead of me jumping ahead, please do type in your ideas for keeping your environment engaging. Um, I know we don't only want to keep our physical environment engaging, but also our presentation. So when you do a theory lesson, are you engaging our students tuning in or tuning out? Um, some of the ways we do that is make sure we incorporate um, enough student talking time so that you're not the only one talking, using um, strategies like think, pair, and share, um, having kids do you know, thumbs up and thumbs down for whether or not they agree with uh, something, just keep doing little things to keep them involved. Um, and with positive relationships, we know how critically important it is, and again, as a CTE teacher, you have more time with these students, so it's more important that you have a positive relationship because you will be spending a longer period of time than a 42-minute period. And this is, I don't think this is in Tracy's slide, but one of the things that I find um, I see over and over and over and over again in articles for new teachers, but I think it bears repeating for experienced teachers is, the very simple strategy of are you standing at the door and greeting by name each student as they enter? Not, not checking your email and kind of distractedly saying hello, but are you standing at the door and greeting each student by name? They say that goes a long, long way. So um, I'm guessing, Tracy, are you back? I see that her, her slides are changing. Okay, so that would go with showing genuine interest in your students caring about your students' success. Do you know your students? Do you know if they're in scouting? Do you know if they play football? Uh, do you know if they like fishing? How much do you know and, and how many um, personal connections can you make uh, with your students? And then, of course, the parents. Uh, one, of the, one of the ideas we heard 
uh, from some of our other groups, I thought this was a great idea, and then someone else said they do it all the time, and that is letting kids use their cell phone to text a parent when you compliment them. So let's say a student creates something of a finished product or does something like, you know, something great in class. That might be an opportunity given if you're allowed to do this and if the student has a cell phone to say, hey, get your cell phone out, take a selfie, a picture of yourself with the student, and say to the student, send that to your mom right now, send that to your dad right now, and tell them I said, this is your great work for the day, you know, or something. So just doing that immediate, quick, I would love to get a text from one of my son, my son is 17, I'd love to get a text from one of his teachers saying, hey, here's what Gray did today, and here's a picture of us. So I love that quick idea. Um, Pat, I'm sorry, Kathy, this is Jennifer. I've been um, chatting with Tracy. Unfortunately, for some reason, her phone system is not allowing her to call back in or the, the webinar system. So we do apologize, everyone, and apologize to Tracy as well. Some, some sort of technical glitch beyond our control has occurred, um, which is one of the downsides of meeting via um, Internet. So um, Tracy suggested, Kathy, if, if you don't mind um, finishing up, she'll scroll through her slides, um, and if you could you know, talk about them. Um, before we do that, however, I wanted to see if perhaps we could ask Mark to share some of his ideas. Um, he typed a couple of thoughts into the question box. So, Mark, I'm going to try unmuting you and just ask you to tell us a bit about um, your ideas for relationships. Hi, Mark. Hi. Hi. Uh, I'm not sure what you're asking, but uh, I try to use social learning a lot, and I took a, a course through uh, Pennsylvania uh, School and uh, down in Philadelphia. And what, what they talked about is um, when you uh, when you think about yourself, how do you learn a lot of stuff? You learn by talking to other people. A lot of people don't like to read or whatnot. So if you can allow the kids to get information from each other, um, that helps out a lot. It helps social learning, but the, what you have to do is make sure that bad habits aren't being transferred back and forth in that respect. Um, and then uh, another idea they gave us was um, before you start a lesson, you might throw five words up there, vocab words, and have them use it in a paragraph. If, you know, one word per sentence, and make up a story. If you don't know how to use it backwardly, make up a story, and they make up funny stories and get a kick out of it. But afterwards, um, they have to use those same five vocab words in a story accurately. So that, that helps them, it gives them started in the lesson, helps them uh, summarize the lesson when you're finished. And then as far as the, the positive relationships, I do try to, to shake their hands when they come in the door, I get out in the hall and welcome them. And then on the way, I try to shake their hands too. I think that goes a long way with building respect. That's all I have written down. Okay. Well, thank you so much for, for sharing those. And, um, you know, I guess with the shaking hands, it, it builds those relationships, but it also is um, helps out with a, a job interviewing employability type skill so that they get comfortable with, with how to do that in a, in a job situation. So um, certainly some really great um, things that you're doing in your classroom. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Mark. This is Kathy. I'm, I'm going to say, you know, again, having a 17-year-old son, um, I remember just a few years ago when uncles and, you know, family friends started reaching out to shake his hand, you know, men, when they would see him, like almost sort of like this rite of passage, he became old enough. And I remember realizing, I thought I taught him manners, he does open the car door for me, so I've, I've scored at least something there. But I remember he seemed so awkward about it, he didn't have the experience to, you know, to grab a man's hand shake it, look him in the eye, and now he's very comfortable with that. So I think you're right, Mark, as far as that just, that's something as a parent I never thought about needed to be taught. Um, so you're doing a great service there. And as far as social learning, you know, it, it's so hard for us as teachers to take our, to just be quiet sometimes and let kids learn from each other um, and have those opportunities. It's so hard. We just want to keep telling them what, what we think they need to know. So. I, I like both of your ideas very much. Um, so teamwork, team building activities, that is one of the things we hear from employers over and over in so many different surveys that they want people who are able to work on a team. 
and get along with others. Kathy, um, I think, I'm sorry, but okay. before you continue on, I think that Lou might have something that he would like to add. Lou, I'm going to unmute your microphone. Did you have a question, Lou, or something that you would like to, to add to the conversation? Please go ahead. Hi, Lou. Lou, I've unmuted your microphone. It looks like perhaps you might have it muted on your end. If you see the, the microphone icon in your control panel, try clicking on that, please. Okay, try it now, please. Okay, I'm still not hearing from you, unfortunately. So if you have a question or comment and would like to type that into the question box, I'll be happy to share that with with the group. So sorry, Lou, I don't know what's happening there. All right. So Kathy, if, if you have any um, thoughts that you'd like to share, unfortunately, I don't think we'll be able to get Tracy back on audio. But if you have any thoughts on on this um, slide that's showing, um, well, go ahead. Just that last uh, that last thing, um, those those weekend summary or fireside chat, Monday huddle, whatever you call it, but doing a weekly kind of team meeting in an informal setting. Um, there's studies to show that, that uh, if you've ever heard of restorative practices, it's a great way to build community and put community in place so that when something goes wrong in the community, when someone finds something missing from their locker or when there's been a fight in the classroom, you already have in place this um, procedure for sitting together and, and talking and touching base, what's working, what's not working. And um, my suggestion is if you do something like that, and many of you probably already do, that you don't do it with them sitting at desks in a row, but that they're sitting in a circle, it's informal, you're not really the leader, you're just more of a facilitator. And you start with something as simple as, uh, what, what, what's, your, what's going to be on your plate at Thanksgiving? What's going to be the biggest thing you have on your plate? I mean, you just start with something and everybody gets a quick moment to share. And then you, you, you do that every now and then and throw some things in like, what's going on in the classroom that's working? Is there something that's not working? Anyway. That's been proven to be very effective. Um, Tracy, if you can hear me and want to go to the next slide. I'm not sure if Tracy can hear me. Can she hear me? I don't oh, think she can, but I'm, I'm tough. Okay, yeah. this is really fun. It's like we can't hear Tracy, but she can hear us. Oh, this is like the, this is the technology I love. Um, so Tracy found, uh, has these from her school. She has a, a couple of teachers that make, I'm going to call them brag boards, but she has kids, uh, she has teachers who's, um, who ask the kids to create a board about themselves and they post these. So it not only creates an environment piece that um, looks great when kids come in, but it also helps them feel part of the group. They belong here. And I think there's another one to show if I remember correctly. Uh, there we go. There's another one. And in the interest of time, um, let's keep moving, Tracy. So we, we're going to wrap up in just a minute. I'm not sure what what is next. Yeah. Jennifer, do you know? Um, I don't recall. We have a bit of a delay because I'm actually typing in to Tracy asking her to advance the slides. So. Oh, this was, her, um, this was the last slide. This is a book that Tracy recommended. She uses this. Um, she found a lot of ideas out of this book. It's Skills for a Lifetime. And she did suggest that you can contact SREB. I believe these copies, uh, at, at least at conferences, they give these away. So, Oh, and, and Lou can't hear us. I'm sorry to hear that. And I know he doesn't know I'm saying that, but I know, Jennifer, you'll contact him. And Tracy, if you would just go to the next slide so people see your contact information. If you would like any information on the ideas Tracy gave or to be put in touch, uh, let's skip ahead to the next one, Tracy. If you would like to be put in touch with any of the teachers that Tracy talked about or shared ideas with, she can connect you. And one more slide, Tracy to your email information. And just to um, share what Lou typed into the box, he says, I have students use five vocabulary words a week in a fictional story. They get very creative 
and it helps students to remember the vocabulary. Yeah, you know, I, 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 that's similar to the other response we heard. And I know, I know a law teacher who does that. He puts the new words on the board. Sometimes they're Latin words for criminal justice and lets them just play around with them and make up goofy stories. And then they go back, like the other gentleman said, and use them correctly. Um, there is a, you, you may think, oh, that's a waste of time to have them just play around with those words. But um, they say it takes us anywhere from 15 to 19 opportunities to interact with a new word before we actually remember it and use it. Can you believe that? That's a lot of times. So the more you play with a word, the better chance you have of remembering it, the more you use it. So great. Okay, I'm going to switch screens now and wrap up using my own screen. By the way, I may look like my name is Hans Meter, but that is only because um, I couldn't change it to my own name. So let me go back to my screen and some current slide. Uh, okay, so um, Jennifer, do you want to take this slide and talk about this or do you want me to keep going? Sure, um, I'd be happy to talk about this. So just a few follow-up items for you as, as we wrap up today. Um, Kathy has prepared for all of you a self-assessment tool. Um, and this is something that we will be sending out to you via email in the next day or so. And really, this is not anything that you need to um, send back to us. It's designed to give you an opportunity to, to think through some of the strategies that we've talked about today and identify any areas where you feel that you're really strong um, and maybe have some, some additional examples to share, which would be great. We welcome that, and you're, you're more than welcome to email those to us so that we can distribute them to the group. Um, or if there are areas that you feel like you'd like some additional professional development, perhaps take that information back to your administration or your coaches and um, use it as a starting point for a discussion. So again, that will be coming out to you via email along with the slides from today as well as a copy of your PLC yearbook. And you may recall that that yearbook will serve as a directory for all of the members of our PLC group. Um, it includes names, email addresses, schools, and for those of you who have um, decided to share additional information, there are some other um, points in there. So if you do have any corrections or any information that you would like to add to your listing, or if you're not currently in the listing, um, in the yearbook. I know we've had a few people who have joined us since we put that together. Please let us know because we are going to be publishing a, an updated version of that um, probably in January. So let us know if, if there are any changes or corrections. Um, we encourage you to visit the SAS community for um, our PLC group. If you haven't already, this is where we'll also be posting resources. You can to start a discussion thread if, if there are topics that you would like to get some input on from your colleagues. A lot of um, ways that you can use that and for more information on accessing the SAS community you can refer to the um, October newsletter that we sent out via email and that information will also be coming out in the next couple of days in our November December newsletter. And finally, um, thanks for bearing with me through all these uh, logistics. We encourage you to go ahead and register for our next webinar, which will take place in January. And I'll let Kathy give you the date on that if she has it handy and tell you a little bit about what, what we'll be covering on that webinar. I do. The date for your next webinar is Tuesday, January 21st, and it will be a 1.30 um, afternoon meeting instead of morning. And at this time, I'm very excited about that session. It's called, but I'm not a reading teacher. Those of you who were with us at the Penn State kickoff may remember we talked briefly about, um, you know, all teachers. My husband's a phys ed teacher, health and phys ed. All teachers must be supporting the increase of rigor in our reading and writing and math. And um, we're going to focus on what, what can a CTE teacher do 
um, specifically technical reading, technical writing, that is relevant to you. It's not a made up task. You're not trying to be an English teacher, but what kind of reading and writing can you do to help students understand difficult reading, but without being a trained reading specialist? So I'm excited about that, um, that session. You should come away with a few strategies on when you're reading with students, how can you help make it more accessible to them, and what kind of writing tasks, and how much do you need to correct in students' writing uh, as a non-English teacher, you know, as, as someone who's not an English, not working toward teaching those things like grammar. Okay, so I'm excited about that. Jennifer, should I keep moving? Sure, please go ahead to the next slide. Okay. okay, I think the next slide is my favorite part of this whole day. Uh, this is a quote I've used for decades that I've been in education. I've used it with teachers and parents, and I'd like to read it to you, and I'd like to see if you agree. You can type in your comment as I'm reading it. I've come to a frightening conclusion. I am the decisive element in the classroom. It's my personal approach that creates the climate. It's my daily mood that makes the weather. As a teacher, I possess a tremendous power to make a child's life miserable or joyous. I can be a tool of torture or an instrument of inspiration. I can humiliate or heal. In all situations, it is my response that decides whether a crisis will be escalated or de-escalated and a child humanized or dehumanized. I think that says it all about the power we have in our own classroom. And you know if you are the parent of children in school and your child comes home and has been dehumanized or has been humiliated by a teacher, you know how painful it is and how it can impact the whole family. So I hope you agree with me that um, we have the power to make our classroom engaging. We have the power to make our um, relationships strong with students and among students. And it's our thoughtful reflection and, and those little choices we make every day that create that kind of climate. Thank you for joining us today. I, I thank Tracy for joining us as well. Um, Yes, thank you for the nice comments. Uh, Paul said that he enjoyed that quote, and thanks for sharing. I will be sending out the PowerPoint to you all. We are running out of time, but if anyone wants to post a question, we can get her a comment. We can get one or two more in. Please do register for the next webinar. Have a great Thanksgiving and a great holiday season. We will not be talking to you. I know if you're a, a hunter, big day coming up I, from a family of hunters, and I know that Thanksgiving brings in a whole new um, great time for, for some of you. All right, is there anything else, Jennifer, before we say goodbye? I don't think so. I don't, I don't see any additional um, com comments or questions. So thanks, everyone, for participating today. Hope that you've heard some, some new ideas or um, things to try in the classroom. And we'll look forward to meeting with you again in January. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye.